Hello and welcome to another episode of the Ice Cream for Everyone podcast. I'm Willem Vanderhorst, your host for the show. Uh, I've been thinking these last couple of weeks and listening to a lot of other podcasts, of course. I'm listening to these podcasters and the people are doing interviews a little bit in the same vein, or at least, well, I'm imitating a little bit of what they're doing, really. They all have a catchphrase. There's generally a catchphrase to introduce the show, and I'm not sure I have one. I mean, I've been saying hello and welcome to, and I, you know, I have a name for the podcast, of course, but I think that the, something I'll be doing in the next couple of weeks is think about a catchphrase. So, if ever you have an idea and you're listening to this, you have an idea for an awesome catchphrase I could be using for this podcast, I would love to hear from you. It'd be awesome. You can send me an email directly through my website on the contact page. Uh, that's at www.icecreamforeveryone.net. Everything attached, icecreamforeveryone.net. Uh, you can also find me and post a comment on the Facebook page. Just, you know, type in Ice Cream for Everyone. You'll find it. You can use the fantastic new range of Facebook emojis now. It's just like all, everything is more than alike. You can tell me if you're angry at the way I introduced the podcast, or you can tell me that you're sad, or you can tell me that you're haha, I think is another one uh, to indicate that you're laughing, probably. Um, uh, you can also contact me on Twitter, of course. If you don't like Facebook, you don't use it anymore, you can contact me on Twitter. My handle is at HippoWill. Tweet at me. Tweet suggestions for a catchphrase or uh, opening sentence uh, to the Ice Cream for Everyone podcast. If ever you're joining this in the middle and you've not heard about it or it's the first time you're listening, in the show I interview creators and thinkers from a variety of backgrounds uh, that I find most interesting and inspiring. Typically, it's revolving around uh, either marketing, advertising, and media, or innovation, business. I know it's a wide topic, but I work as a marketing and brand strategist. Uh, I used to work for ad agencies, and now I have my old freelance consultancy. And uh, and I'm interested in all these different types of topics, so I'm, I'm finding and talking to people from this area. And the other thing is I have a personal passion for games. I've been a long-time tabletop role-playing gamer, role-playing gamer, yeah, uh, or role-player, depends uh, how you're calling it. But uh, I also love board games. I used to play a lot of video games, a little bit less now. However, I do keep in touch with what's going on in indie games because there's a lot of interesting developments around this particular area. I'm a little bit less interested in the massive, you know, kind of like first-person shooter games, but still the amount of effort, money that goes into creating these productions is, is quite interesting. So I do keep in touch with that. Now, uh, for this show, oh, if you enjoy it, by the way, uh, just to finish on the whole shameless promotion, you can find all the show's episodes on my website, which I've mentioned. You can also find them on iTunes, of course. You can find them on Stitcher or whatever your favorite podcast listening app device site is. Uh, it would enormously help the podcast if you listen via iTunes or even just check and click the iTunes button that's going to be on the show notes if you're looking through my website and give it a rating or take a few minutes to write a review. It really helps other people find the podcast. But on to today's guest. Uh, we have an exciting guest today in the world of role-playing games. We're talking to Matthew Dawkins, also known as the Gentleman Gamer. I wouldn't be able to reproduce it with his great English-British accent. Uh, but Matthew is known amongst people in role-playing games because he started a YouTube channel that's mainly focused on tabletop role-playing games. Uh, and he started that a few years ago, like 2009. He has uh, over 14,000 subscribers and a number of videos. If you're interested in this type of game, check it out. I'll put the link in the show notes. He has stopped publishing regularly right now as of recently because he's spending more time writing at the moment. So he's writing commercially for role-playing games, which we talk about during the interview. Uh, and we talk quite a bit about Vampire the Masquerade, which is a game and a setting. Uh, also, the setting is called The World of Darkness. It's one of the most popular commercial role-playing game settings out there. Uh, we talk about where it comes from and his interest for it and a lot of different things. And this other idea that he started, which is uh, an idea in gaming, mixing principles from live-action role-playing games and tabletop role-playing games and mixing it up in a video conferencing format, uh, he called that vampire of the masquerade the youtube experiment in the first place i tried it and i tried playing and interpreting a character in this game and a little over a year ago matthew and i recorded a video where both the characters we interpret we had decided in advance that they were going to be rival enemies so we kind of riff off and joust verbally in this uh video and i'm going to put it put it on the show notes so if you want to see you know what is it like when i'm interpreting a role-playing game character as a vampire because that's who he is uh, the character is a vampire, although, you know, we're not doing anything specific about that in the, in the, in the video. But, uh, but yeah. So we had a fantastic conversation. It was a lot of fun. 
Uh, we went through loads of details, and as usual, I tried for these episodes. I mean, of course, it might be more of interest to somebody who is into role playing games, but you're not necessarily into role playing games. You don't have to be to be listening to this episode. If you're interested in storytelling, if you're interested in learning about the hobby, we make it in a way that we're explaining everything that we're talking about. So it, it should be accessible for just about anybody or anybody who's interested in finding out more about this type of games and why people practice them. Who are the people that practice them as well? Uh, just a word of warning, I really apologize for this, but there's a couple of fade-offs in speech uh, inside of the video. I really don't think it's a big deal. certainly not enough to break the flow of the conversation. It's just a couple of small details, but still, I apologize for that. I'm still, I'm always trying my best to do, to give the best sound, but there's a couple of, you know, it, it happens, a couple of glitches, essentially. Uh, but without further ado, for your hearing pleasure, here is The Gentleman Gamer. Enjoy. <music> Matthew. Hi there. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Thank you very much for joining me for the show. Uh, it's my pleasure. I'm glad to be here. Appreciate your time. So um, I usually start with a warm-up question. Okay. So you are I'm a Matthew Dawkins, aka The Gentleman Gamer. That's correct. And I came across your YouTube video channel a little over a year ago and, and really enjoyed the videos to start with. Uh, one question I, I saw, you know, you started it, it's called The Gentleman's Guide to, Guide to Gaming, sorry, but the yep. URL and also your Twitter handle is, is Clack Click Bang. Yes. I thought, I was wondering if that had any particular signification. Uh, yeah, uh, okay. In, that, in, in, in fact, that's a good question. I don't often get asked it. <laughs> when I was... Well, it wasn't when I was first getting into role playing, but I was in an online superhero role playing game. Okay. And this was a role playing game set in the DC Comics universe. Uh huh. And it was on Live Journal. It was called JLA Watchtower. And so the different players had different heroes and villains at their disposal. And essentially in this role-playing game, all it really was was a uh, story crafting exercise. We would just post back and forth in character and, and play out interesting scenes. Um, and one of my characters in that was a lesser-known Green Arrow villain by the name of Onomatopoeia. Okay. And Onomatopoeia, uh, for those who don't know, I'm sure most of you do, is a term in English, well, in Greek, I guess, for a word that sounds like it's red, if that makes sense. So, mm -hmm. for instance, uh, bang or, or, or plop or, yeah. or, or, or the like. And uh, Onomatopoeia in the comics, whenever he or she shoot someone will the speech bubble from the character's mouth will say bang or crack or when he places a bomb he says boom it's a really gimmicky villain yeah but the villain never speaks in anything other than on a matter of so it's almost like a breaking the fourth wall kind of uh character in the sense that it knows it's in a comic mm -hmm. and so it's speaking in comic dialogue bubbles uh and so when i was starting up the youtube channel the my character in jla watchtower my predominant one was onomatopoeia and my handle on live journal was clack click bang because okay. that was the sound of onomatopoeia um cocking and firing a gun mm -hmm. and that is where the youtube channel got its handle from okay Perfect. Thank you very much. So, so did that mean most of the time you were expressing yourself in onomatopoeia through the like when you were writing and interpreting that character? Uh, well, I would be able to do plenty of exposition around it. So, mm -hmm. onomatopoeia slowly opens the door and slides into the room, uh, and as he does so, he brings a finger up to his mouth and says "shh" for instance. Yeah. Okay. So, so uh, the, you know that all of his dialogue was onomatopoeia. Uh, and I think it, when I was playing the character, it turned out that it was a, a woman behind the mask, but uh, and there were some revelations, and eventually she recovered her voice. It was all very fun stuff. I suppose these days I'd look back on it and think, well, mm -hmm. I wrote some of that very poorly, but uh, but it was fun while we did it. Okay, cool. 
Um, so just so you know, a, a little bit about the, the podcast. So I usually interview people that I'm you know, well, selfishly interested in in the first place and about their creative process. And of course, role playing games and tabletop games is one of my main hobbies, one of the reasons I'm talking to you now. But I also interview other people and there's other kinds of people that listen to this. So just to be mindful throughout the interview that, you know, people listening might not know too much about role playing games. So I might ask you some questions to specify or or detail a few of your answers. Um, and if we geek out too much about like game systems or things like that, it's just to be mindful and bring it back to explaining things if, if ever there's people that don't really know much about it. Absolutely. We do occupy a very niche hobby. Yeah, exactly. So let's go like a little bit about the beginning and the, the man behind the character. So where did you grow up? Well, I have uh, almost all of my life lived on the south coast of England in a, well, near the south coast of England, moving between the cities of Salisbury and Southampton. Salisbury is home to Stonehenge and uh, a cathedral with the tallest spire in the world. That's that's its tourist features. I've obviously got the pamphlet with me. And (laughs) Southampton is a dive. I wouldn't recommend anyone lives there. But between there, I've lived in Norwich, spent some time in in London. But the but my heart has always remained in the south, and yeah. that is indeed where I live now. Is that also considered? Is it considered the West Country as well over there? Or uh, not quite? Not we're quite. kind of Central South, I think. Uh, as far as the weather report goes, we're Southwest, but. Uh, I think geographically, where Salisbury is pretty much dead in the middle. Yeah, uh, I I had a very rural upbringing. Uh, I didn't actually grow up in Salisbury. I grew up outside of it in a village, uh, some uh, twelve, fifteen miles away. Okay, and so I, I was very much not an urban adventurer uh-huh. uh, as a young man. Went to a village school, uh, Church of England. And uh, not not that I'm a uh, practicing churchgoer by any means, but uh, it meant that I was raised in a certain way. Uh, I suppose you could say with certain values and certain expectations of life, but it, in a sense, it would have been a sheltered upbringing. Okay. Uh, uh, what kind of uh, activities, interests did you get up to when you're? A kid or a child? Well, uh, one thing's for certain, I definitely wasn't a sporty child. Okay. I, uh, my hand-eye coordination has always been dreadful. My reflexes, pr- pretty much just as much. I put that mostly down to lack of practice than anything yeah. else. During I can my, relate to that. Uh, dur- during my uh, childhood, probably up to about the age of 11, when I went to secondary school or high school, as, as the Americans call it. Um, I was very rarely on a playing field, uh, kicking around a ball or anything like that. I was playing with action figures, He-Man, Thundercats, Ghostbusters figures, mm. WWF wrestling figures. I was uh, telling stories and playing them with my friends. Uh, one of the first things I w- did, I suppose, in the sphere of role-playing mm-hmm was uh, from about the age of eight, I was buying Choose Your Own Adventure books of yes. the fighting fantasy genre. Not final fantasy, but fighting fantasy. Yeah. Uh, they are the uh, sort of medieval fantasy books by Ian Livingstone and Steve Jackson, yeah. where you create your own character and go into Firetop Mountain and try and kill the warlock and face various monsters and puzzles whilst en route. I, I love doing that despite my age and the uh, saleswoman in WH Smith, I recall her saying to my mother, I think he's a little too young for these. Oh, really? Did you, were you the kind of reader of those that, because I used to do that with a, with the choose your own adventure. You'd just like, well, at some point feel stuck and go check just quickly. Like what happens in each of the page offers? Oh yeah. Who, who, uh, <laughs> everyone cheated. I don't know anyone who didn't cheat. Uh, exactly. It's uh, only in, only when I went back to them later that I started playing them seriously. But for me, it was more of a mental playground, a fantasy setting that I could then take to the playground at school. Mm-hmm. And I could say to my friends, and I, I always seem to be the organizer of these things, but okay. I would say to my friends, okay, so we're in Scorpion Swamp. You are serving this character. You're serving Pasha Pook. You're ser- serving um i'm trying to remember the names of the characters in that novel um and and these are the adventures you'll go through and we'd create a map as we played on the playground and and i'm sure most of the other children probably looked at us and wondered what on earth we were doing uh but 
We, so you, we had a lot of fun with it. Yeah, that's great. So you like naturally fell into the role of being the, the leader, the game master, even before starting to play role-playing games. Yeah, uh, there's uh, certainly an element of me, uh, and I don't think this is restricted to running games, but I, I like to manage, I like to, I like to have control, I like to... Uh, lead and that doesn't mean I want I will seize power I'm not some tyrant but (laughs) I certainly like to be the man with the plan okay and it it allows me to feel more comfortable I Mm. suppose uh and from there where did you study later on well I went on to secondary school a uh place called wyvern technology college uh, which is still around Uh, no real wyverns there sadly where i had a fantastic history teacher uh, and by the name of mr kite who i i had always been into history from a very young age i had a grandfather who uh, instilled in me the value of history and would tell me stories about the english civil war and the like with great flourish and and made up facts like charles the first was too fat to escape his window at carisbrook castle on the isle of Wight, and so got decapitated by the window and and for many years that's how i thought charles the first lost his head <laughs> but uh, in fact that is not the case and so I really embraced the humanities when I was at school and went on to college, Salisbury College, where I studied in my first year a diverse array of subjects, I suppose, Uh, English literature, history, archaeology and drama and theatre studies. Uh, which I suppose if you pair them up, English literature and drama, that makes Mm. sense. Archaeology and history, that makes sense. And the second year of that, it was English literature, history and archaeology. Mm. But from there, I never went on to university. I am (laughs) not university educated. Uh, I certainly did open university, but never completed a degree because of financial reasons mostly, Mm. but uh, and time. Did you have an idea in mind about like what kind of job or career you wanted to get into at that time? I, I flitted around for a very young age. I wanted to be a professional wrestler, which, uh, let's be honest, was never going to happen. Awesome. Uh, another point, I wanted to be a doctor. But when I was a teenager, I wanted to become a teacher uh-huh. of history and English literature. So I did apply to university in in various uh, places. I wanted to go to the University of uh, Bath or Bath and <laughs> the and I would have got in, however, the based on my A-level results, but my college lecturer never actually sent on my UCAS form and UCAS is the agency in the UK that deals with filtering out applications to different universities based on grades okay. and essentially part of that procedure is you have to fill in your form indicating the universities you want to go to the degree you want to study and do a personal statement like a job application yeah and you have to give that to your college or sixth form tutor uh, so the tutor you have between the ages of 17 and 18 mm-hmm. And they have to essentially give you a reference and then pass it on to UCAS. Sadly, he left his in his desk drawer over the summer. (laughs) And so while all my friends were being accepted in universities, I was wondering, why haven't I heard anything back? I've not been been accepted. I've not been declined. Some people were being declined and I wasn't even getting that. So in the end, I called UCAS and they said, no, we never received your application, sadly. And I got in touch with my tutor and he very apologetically said, oh, I just found your application. At that point, I could have gone through a system called clearing where you're essentially placed in whatever university has a space Mm -hmm. or I could have carried on doing what I was doing, which was working, well, working. I I had a job by that point. I was earning money and the the allure of continuing to earn money outweighed the allure of further education. I understand. I had a quite similar experience with the university, actually. Well, not, I mean, not as in being rejected, but as in starting to work, earning money and feeling it it was a lot more interesting than... Yeah, uh, academics, essentially. Yeah, well, I've done, I've you know, I've done well by it. It's, uh, I certainly seem to be uh, earning a decent amount, mm-hmm. and uh, not having a degree has never held me back, and certainly I don't have any debt as a result. 
Um, but, uh, you know, most people, the advantage most people take away from university or say they take away from university is a social awareness. Yeah. And uh, I suppose going straight into work, that's something I lacked and something I probably didn't gain until I was in my mid twenties. Uh, I, I, well, well that, that's un, unfair on myself. Probably the early, my early twenties, uh, I remained quite sheltered and mm. solitary, um, not a wide pool of friends by mm. any means or interests. Fair enough. And so what did you end up doing in terms of jobs or like, did you change or what do you do now, I guess? Uh, well, uh, I, not ironically, but coincidentally, the job that I went into immediately after college yeah. is uh, with the company that I work for now. Uh, I oh, won't really? name drop them, but uh, it's, no, it's a company it's that deals with, um, with, with money, basically. It's okay. pensions, investments, finance, that kind of thing. Okay. And s- certainly it's not what most people would call the most thrilling field in the world, but it, I work in training. Okay. Uh, in in that area, so I train employees. Uh, I I handle um, I, uplifting people to certain skills, and that to me is a very rewarding job because it means I get to meet lots of people, I get to talk to lots of people, yeah. And uh, it, it's it's a nice job to feel like I am, I suppose, making people better at theirs. Yeah. This is interesting. So so do you think that? playing role playing games and practicing helped you like get into your role as a trainer now or did you have any other well training to uh, no ab- absolutely it it definitely did because when i first started this wasn't my job and yeah. i would say the watershed moments for me uh, in terms of my career progression and this isn't even including my freelance writing which, which i imagine yeah, which we'll talk will, about of course uh, as well too yeah uh i was probably uh well a few factors one would be my my wife uh the primary reason very supportive mm. individual uh who will encourage me to do absolutely anything that i want within reason mm-hmm. uh another would be my youtube channel yeah and uh, I would like to think of a third reason because we humans like to operate in trinities, but <laughs> I'll, I'll probably stick to the YouTube channel because uh, the channel that I set up to talk about role-playing games, yep. I, I've been running games for a long time before I was on YouTube talking about them. Actually, just so certain- before we talk about YouTube, do you want to tell us like when you found out about role-playing games and how that uh, started? That, yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, that was when I you. was at college yeah so i was 18 i imagine 17 or 18 and there was a i was sat in the library at the college and i was looking up npcs from a video game you've probably heard of called called baldur's gate yes and i was just trying to min max my party like any good role player would just 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 for mentioning npc is a non-playing character so it's all the other people in the game that you're not playing basically yeah so in Baldur's gate you create your character whether he be a fighter wizard cleric or rogue or the like and throughout the game you can recruit followers for your protagonist yeah and these followers can be of many different points of view they could have different philosophies they can have different abilities to use in combat they may be spellcasters they may be knights with swords they could be evil they could be good they could be lawful they could be chaotic Essentially, there's a huge range. Uh, I think there's something like 20 different uh, followers for Baldur's Gate, which is a very old game and has an amazing range considering its age. Mm. Uh, Each of the characters has a lot of depth. They have their own backstory and so on. And so I found that kind of thing fascinating, the idea of tailoring a party, seeing how one character would interact with another. And this was before I was role-playing. And as just point of fact i had been reading forgotten realms novels for probably about 10 years prior to okay. playing Baldur's gate Baldur's gate is set in a setting known as the forgotten realms and the forgotten realms unbeknownst to me at the time was a setting for a du- dungeons and dragons uh well for dungeons and dragons the yeah. sort of preeminent role-playing game yeah and so I was looking up these non-player characters in the library uh, on one of the PCs there, and a guy came over to me mm-hmm. and in creepy fashion 
<laughs> puts his hand on mine while it was on the mouse. Okay. Direct, yeah, I know. Uh, directed <laughs> it to the search bar and typed in, uh, may have been tsr.com or wizards.com and illuminated me in the world of tabletop role-playing games and he said there was a club in our town and he invited me to come along and of course when he invited me the first time i was reticent shall we say i didn't Uh go because i thought who is this creepy guy (laughs) and in fairness he he is still a creepy guy and uh and and a conservative counselor for for salisbury sometimes Uh, one of the issues with some of the people in our hobby (laughs) the creepiness yeah. Fortunately, uh, it's not everybody. But no, no, and I, I went along uh, eventually and thought it was up under the auspices of playing a game of Dungeons and Dragons. This game I'd been reading about unknowingly for a decade and playing video games set in that world unknowingly. Yeah. And maybe if I'd read the manual, I would have picked up on that. But I turned up to this club, and my first role-playing game wasn't Dungeons and Dragons. That was on the other week. These games ran every other week. Mm -hmm. There were three tables. And on table three, which was the table I was assigned to, on one week they ran Dungeons and Dragons. The campaign was Ruins of Mithranor, which is a late second edition, early third edition Dungeons and Dragons campaign. It was built to have conversion in and between systems. Okay. But that wasn't the game I played. I was ended up playing a game of Hercules and Xena, The Legendary Journeys. Interesting. Which was just about the last game I would have wanted to play. (laughs) I didn't even know that was a role-playing game, but nothing surprises me in terms of setting anymore. No, no, this was uh, released, uh, I suppose, around the time that tie-ins were were constant, but it was a box set game, uh, so a big cardboard box with various manuals, one for the player, one for the person running, a campaign module, and essentially it was high camp Greek myth. Yeah. And my character, if I recall, was an acrobatic thief of some variety who uh, I very swiftly, and it's it's amazing looking back because I, I don't think I've spoken in detail about this game, but it's strange the things you remember. Yeah. Uh, I remember my character who was a uh, yeah female uh, acrobatic thief who sort of played for laughs and, and the next big score. Uh, I ended up, uh, it turned out, I think I made her androgynous in the end. And, and I think the main reason was as a rebuttal to, to uh, male role players who felt that their male characters had to hit on her. Uh, because she was female mm. uh, and immediately getting into the hobby i started encountering the good because we i was role playing as fantastic and it really was good fun despite the game uh which you know nothing actually against the game but the setting wasn't for me um the some of the players were shall we say socially awkward mm-hmm. and so i was dealing with the good and the less good <laughs> quite yeah. quite immediately and so i suppose there was a time there where i could have said you know what this is all a little uncomfortable and not for me i'll stick to my video games and novels Mm -hmm. Uh, but i persevered and then played dungeons and dragons the week after uh, where i was playing a a rogue again uh, an elven rogue and whose name was probably something stereotypical like tasha nightshade but i think she was she was a 15th level character so my first ever character in dungeons and dragons was a ridiculously high level yeah and i had a lot of powers to juggle but i thought hey, i've been playing Baldur's gate 2 by this point so I, i'm i'm fine yeah. i know what i'm doing with this i know <laughs> do, all these you th- do you think there was any particular uh reason that captured your attention to go back another week the hmm i think for for all I bash them, and I do it in a very light-hearted way because all of these people really are, are decent, uh, you know, for yeah. all their, while they may be socially awkward at times, they all have their hearts in the right place and they're all there to play a game. Mm. And that is what I particularly love, the creativity, the imagination on display. When the DM, the dungeon master or GM, games master, the person running says... 
you walk into a room, this is what it looks like, what do you do? I know yeah. that's a very basic setup, but then you hear all the either the players colla- collaborate, they talk to each other, what shall we do? Oh, well, I think I should do this, I think you should do that. Or they suddenly, they spontaneously start coming out with, well, I'm going to draw my sword and charge at the beholder mm-hmm. because, because you're an idiot. <laughs> but, the, but the point is that that kind of spontaneous play, improvisational skill and imagination on display really grabbed me, even in Hercules and Xena, and it just became more pronounced in Dungeons & Dragons because that was a world I knew. Mm-hmm. So immediately I could start spouting off about the gods that I'd read about in all the novels, about magic, about NPCs, and I think in the end it probably frustrated the DM because I was saying, oh, I'd love to see this in your game, and th- this would be a fantastic thing to encounter. And I remember him saying to me, a guy called Simon, uh, he said, yeah, but I'm running this game. <laughs> and uh, it was at that point I thought, ah, yes, yeah, you know, this isn't entirely collaborative. But <laughs> yeah, it was a hook that uh, borrowed into me and hasn't quite let go yet. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so you started running games yourself like shortly after? or Yeah, it didn't take me long yeah. at all. I... The first role-playing game I picked up, the first supplement I picked up, was actually Magic of Faerun. For uh, Faerun is the world in the Forgotten Realms, or the continent in the Forgotten oh, okay. Realms in which you play. And I picked that up before I picked up the Player's Handbook, Dungeon Master's Guide, and Monster Manual for Dungeons & Dragons, which are the three core books that you really need to play or run. Yeah, And... Because I was reading through Magic of Faerun, I was thinking, wow, I'd like to put this and this and this in the game. And I'd have the characters, first of all, starting an orc and then fighting an orc. Then they'd be fighting a troll. Then they'd be fighting uh, a mind flare, then a beholder and this and that. And so I wrote a very poor adventure, which would see all in one forest, the range of monsters from challenge rating one through to challenge rating 20 and hope against hope the players might survive. I suppose it was a proto-tome of horrors. Interesting. So um, like a, a forest fighting, street fighting style, style thing, one after the other. Yeah, exactly. And and I quickly became aware, okay, this isn't how it's going to work. So mm. I think it was about six months after starting, I had written my first Dungeons & Dragons uh campaign Mm -hmm. and it was a campaign it wasn't just a one shot the first thing i ran saw uh, the players characters going up against the cult of the dragon in the dragon coast city of elver salts where i uh, commonly set my forgotten realms games now probably for nostalgia reasons and because in the novel temple hill that is where that's where that novel is set and it really grabbed my imagination when i read it i recall and um yeah, the cult of the dragon, an evil organization, of course, because they're called a cult, um, were kidnapping children for the purposes of sacrificing them to perform a ritual that would allow a baby dragon to grow up faster than it should so it could literally burst from the streets of the city and et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And so the party of characters had to foil that, and it was a game that went surprisingly well but did see Elvisul getting demolished by the avatar of a god yeah. who, who just popped up because I think the power maybe went to my head. <laughs> but but it, yeah, it was good fun. Cool. Uh, and so on to the, the, your YouTube channel. You started that in 2009, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I, well, yeah, I guess it must be. I, you, you probably know better than I do. I just checked yesterday, apparently. Yeah. Well, at least the first <laughs> video remaining, because I think you had a few that were deleted because of music rights or something, mm-hmm. yeah. uh, well, was recent. late 2009. Yeah, when I first started, I, for some reason, had this idea in my mind that people aren't going to be interested in listening to what I've got to say, so I should put music on in the background. I don't know why I had that thought i must have been some kind of imbecile i noticed uh, the I, music on the video I, I checked out that first video and i was going to ask you the question as well i was like that was interesting to have music background but yeah yeah <laughs> i don't because i've been watching uh videos like um that well to wind back the yeah. reason i was started doing the youtube channel was because i loved role-playing games i played a whole host of role-playing games in many cities and yeah. at conventions by this point 
and I realized no one was talking about them on YouTube, or rather, there were only two channels, two or three channels that were uh, Kurt Weagle's Game Geeks, which mm-hmm. is still going, okay. Captain Machine, who was, uh, who's a, 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 I met him, and he's a, incredibly nice guy but it was very amateur vlog uh a guy called tetsubo who is still going and that was role-playing game videos intermixed with other videos on politics and yes. humanities and the like so i just decided lo- i'll add my voice to the choir cool were you looking for something in particular when you were like looking for um role-playing game youtube videos or yeah it just, I- you enjoyed watching a range of different youtube videos or I was looking for reviews at first, mm. uh, which I think is a good ga- gateway, uh, and it's a good way to actually get views on your videos. It's by yeah. doing views because that's the thing most people are going to stick around for. Mm. And I remember finding a review of Slay Industries, which is a role-playing game of which I'm pretty fond, by Captain Machine, and thinking, you know what, I could do a better review than this. Sorry, Captain, if you hear this. <laughs> and so I, I built up my channel with a few videos and um and and another vlogger that i drew a lot of inspiration from at the start or thought i was drawing a lot of inspiration from was a guy called who does a channel called the spoonie experiment which wasn't at that point role-playing game focused but he was he was a, he's a role player, and so it was very geeky. And before he disappeared up his own ass, he was an incredibly entertaining vlogger. Mm. But, um, I've, yeah, for some reason I thought music in the background, that will be what sets my videos apart from other people. Interesting. And it wasn't. And <laughs> in fact, it's what got most of my videos taken down, rightly so. But yeah. some of those videos are still viewable on Daily Motion. Uh, I, I my initial reaction to YouTube removing my videos was, well, that's fine. I'll just decamp and move elsewhere. And so I did, and no one watched them. <laughs> and then I thought, you know what? I'll just carry on doing the videos, but without the music, and yeah. went back to YouTube, and so yeah. it went. Did you have anything in mind doing it a video show rather than like an audio one? Or is it, was it simply because you were looking at videos at the time? I think it was simply because uh, I was looking at videos. And as a learner, and this, I suppose, goes back to my training, Mm. there's uh, three kinds of uh, learner. There's audible learners, uh, visual learners, and kinesthetic learners. Mm -hmm. And kinesthetic are the strangest ones, to my mind, or at least they're the least common. They're the ones who need to learn by by using things, their sense of touch. And I suppose that's the sort of person that can only learn about a role-playing game by playing it rather than reading it. Mm. Uh, And then, of course, you have audible learners and visual learners, uh, and what they are is quite apparent. And I have always been a very visual learner. Mm. And so for me, putting myself in videos and talking about games, expressing, you know, using my hands, holding up books, and letting my face do a lot of the talking was, was key, I think. Yeah, yeah. And one of the things I really appreciate about your videos is, is I would say you're 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 really articulate and I'd say quite eloquent as well. Actually, it's that. Oh, thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, do you think that's like out of any particular training or practice? Like aside, I mean, is it like down to role playing games entirely, or something else? Do you think? Um, or just it's, natural. <laughs> well, uh, I've I've certainly never gone to any kind of speech coaching. This actually goes all the way back to primary school, so way way back. Mm. When I was a very young child, I spoke, and now that I'm going to be doing it, I uh, now that I'm going to be talking about it, I will start doing it again. I spoke incredibly slowly. I mm-hmm put an awful lot of pauses between my words and I spoke very methodically. I thought intently about what I was going to say before I said it. Mm. I think part of that was uh, due to a hope of, but I never wanted to be embarrassed. I never wanted to say the wrong thing. But most of the time it was simply because without trying to make myself sound superb i was a very thoughtful person not i was an incredibly nice person but as a child i needed to think about things before i did them and this ties in again to me not not being the most reflexive or coordinated person when it comes to reaction speed uh that's the reason i don't drive a car (laughs) but i 
uh, yeah, I always had to think about things. And so when I was young, I was, I was constantly bullied for this because it was different. Mm. As a child, I spoke quite deeply and I spoke quite slowly. And so I trained myself maybe actively i'm not sure but i know that there was on some conscious level an effort and this was only by the time i got to about 17 Mm -hmm. to start speeding up but speak with the same clarity Mm -hmm. that i always had and if there's one thing i can say for myself i always aim to speak with clarity i I want people to understand every single word i say and i want to pronounce every single syllable in a word yeah Uh, my my wife sometimes mocks the fact that something in this part of the country if someone says beetroot Mm -hmm. they'll say beetroot yeah so beetroot. I say beetroot. So most people say beetroot. If if I say bottle rather than bottle, uh, uh, it's it's a very simple thing. There's lots of it's like I, I might say Wednesday or wed yeah or February. I say February rather than February. Okay. And I so I read how I rather I speak how I read, and that is why I come across as I do on my videos. That's no different to how I come across in person. Yeah, got it. And, uh, well, and just my final thought on that, yep. I get, I get an awful lot of good feedback from non-English or non-native English speakers on my channel. So uh, from Italian, Spanish, Portuguese, yes. who say that they particularly enjoy my channel because they understand everything I'm saying. Yes, absolutely. And I think part of that, when I was at school, just like most people in my generation, I studied French. And there was a part of the French language, I, I'm, I'm not fluent in it by any means, but I like the way that they will put an object at the end of a sentence. Yeah. So, and it's the same with most mainland European languages. And that tends to be how I speak as well. I, I will never end a sentence on a preposition, uh, and I'm about to, uh, <laughs> unless I can help it. Uh, but yeah, it's it's always uh, somewhere in my mind I want people yeah. to understand yeah. what I'm saying. Well, which is great. I'm, I'm, uh, given I participated in a contribute to another podcast about role playing games in French, and I am French. Uh, there's, I know that people in France are appreciative of that when they, when somebody speaks quite clearly and slowly like you do, um, about your video channel. So you stopped producing videos regularly a few months ago, I think to spend more time concentrating on writing as far as I understand. Yep. But before that, like how many hours a week did you spend on your channel approximately? Oh, I, I, I don't know. I never kept a tally. Just the a same lot. as I, I never recorded uh, <laughs> when I started. Okay. Uh, but the, I think the thing that probably took my most of my time for my channel, and I speak about this in the past tense, yeah. and I'll get to why I'm speaking, and I'll hopefully remember to, is I hated making cuts in videos. Right. My, my idea of what a good vlog would be is someone who can speak confidently about the subject matter, who the audience is going to trust because they're speaking confidently. And I found that cuts and edits don't do that. Mm. Uh, And so if I got seven minutes into a 15-minute vlog and lost track of what I was saying, started repeating myself or just phased out, I would stop and I would start again. So... In that sense, I'm something of a perfectionist or an obsessive. I that I think there are very few of my vlogs where you will ever see any kind of cut, including the incredibly lengthy ones. I like to wow. get my message out uh, in, in one. And what this leads to, of course, is an awful lot of time, sometimes over an hour spent on producing a 10-minute vlog because I want it to look pristine as pristine as it can when it's just a guy speaking to a camera because yeah. it's not like I've ever used special effects or anything like that. So uh, did uh, you script your videos as well? Did you write them up a little bit or sometimes I've never scripted fully. Okay. Uh, because and this is the thing, although the vlogging the channel really took up a huge portion of my life or my focus at least. It never seemed to be a big time drain. Mm. I 
never want a, 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 on one hand I, I want to treat it like it was a professional endeavor so something i wanted to take absolutely seriously on the other hand there was a part of me that felt this is a hobby of mine this is yeah. something that i don't want to take seriously because if i start taking it seriously it will stop being fun yeah so i always felt that if i had to write a script word for word of what i was going to say in a video all of a sudden this has stopped being a channel about spontaneous thought this has stopped being a channel about imagination and i've now i've now basically got a scripted show and there are plenty of people that do have and it works for them and it never worked for me so the most i ever did in the way of scripts was a couple of bullet points on a list that i would refer to before recording and occasionally i would have that list stuck to the camera if it was a really long subject matter that i wanted to go through yeah. most of the time it was for reviews that yeah. i would do that okay. but the the thing that most people I only started doing this in the last, I suppose, two, maybe three years, which sounds like a long time, but I suppose since 2009 it's not. Uh, with the reviews, I started introing each of them with a piece of fiction mm. set in the game. So I started that, I think, with Changeling the Lost yeah. and carried on for, with uh, with my videos from there. And the reason I did that was because I felt Telling people about systems and fiction from a removed perspective wasn't terribly enthralling. But if I start in media res, essentially, yep. it would be more more gripping for the viewer. And that material was never scripted. I always made that up on the spot or based on some random ideas I might have had floating around after reading the book. Well. So part of the appeal to me of doing that was it would tell me how well I had got the game mm. because I kind of do this for myself as well I don't re-watch the videos but I do want to understand a game to the degree that I can a video on it anyway yeah. that's me rambling off on a tangent yeah, for quite yeah, a long yeah. time no no it's kind of, it's fine uh <clears throat> really interesting the another type of video that you had or have i mean and, and that you recorded another one as, as early as like yesterday night is interviewing other game designers and that's something that i've started doing as well so and you have a lot more experience than me in that so i thought i'd ask you how you prepare for them usually what, what kind of preparations do you do for your interviews no, oh, okay. Well, in that case, I'm about to contradict myself because <laughs> interviews, I not last night's one, to be fair, but interviews, I do scripts to a degree. You can't really control where the guest goes, but you certainly have points that you want to refer to. And that's easier because it's a live stream. You will have a Word document up on your PC that you can refer to with, yeah. with various questions you want to ask. Uh, my first interview was Mark Reinhagen. Mm. And I had never intended to interview uh, multiple game designers. I went for Mark because I had a history of making vampire-related videos. Yeah, which is perfect because that's like the next topic I want to go into. See oh, how, okay. they, how things work. That's brilliant. <laughs> and uh, and I know, and I started looking up Mark Reinhagen because I knew of Mark Reinhagen. He was the initial one of the initial creators for Vampire the Masquerade and the World of Darkness. And so I was looking into him. Where had he gone? Why wasn't he involved in the game anymore? And I managed to track him down. And he was still at this point somewhat in the woods. And I, I'm i not going to take full credit for exposing the world to Mark Reinhagen again because he had games in the pipeline that he was intending on coming back to. But yep. that interview was the first, as far as I know, exposure to Mark Reinhagen the world had in six years uh, since he disappeared in Georgia. Um after leaving uh well after cashing in his sh white wolf shares mm -hmm. and so after that because that the interview went down really well people it came as a surprise i don't think i did an in a video prior to that saying i'm going to be interviewing mark reinhagen i don't recall doing that. i may have but it came as a surprise to a lot of people not only to see mark reinhagen but also to see me interviewing mark reinhagen uh and so I thought, well, I could I could make a bit of a thing of this. So yeah. I then went to Ed Greenwood. I essentially went to game designers who 
have had an impact on me. Yeah. And while there are plenty of others who have had huge impacts on the hobby, uh, I've never approached them because I want the interview to be f- as fun for me as it is for the viewer and hopefully for the guest. Yeah. And if I'm talking to someone about a game of which I know very little, yeah. there's a... Um, a by the way example of not using a preposition at the end of a sentence <laughs> uh i could have said oh, um i can't even do it a, a, a game i know very little of yeah, yeah that doesn't sound right at all anyway um no but i have the same kind of approach I'm, I'm starting to contact and i have been contacting the people that you know i, I really appreciate the games of that i have the more experience with etc et makes more sense Obviously, a guest is going to be more inclined to appear on a show if they have something to sell. That doesn't make them mercenary or uh, or unkind, but they, these people have private lives and they don't necessarily want to be in the public eye. So I was very fortunate with Mark that at the time he was developing board game by the name of Democracy, yes. Sandy... Peterson, I think, was just in the run-up to Cthulhu Wars, and Justin Achille was... uh, I think he was on one of the Vampire 20th Anniversary products, and so on. So, uh, I've always... Did you have Democracy? Do you have it? I have it. I do. I've played it a couple of times. Uh, Sadly, it is uh, currently in the... It's in the pile of board games. Uh, It is a good game, uh, but I don't think it's my group's game. Yeah, it's not... I've only played it once, uh, and I'd like to pull it out again at some point, but, uh, yeah, anyway, life is... The the biggest disappointment, uh, to to take this into review territory for Uh a sec, the biggest disappointment about Democracy, Democracy, for the listeners, is a game in which you essentially all play different American political... Not parties, but representatives with certain points of view. So you have protectionists, you have uh, conservatives, you have progressives, libertarians, and the like. And you have various bills put before you you vote on whether they pass or fail each of you also has a role in the court so you have a lawmaker you have a person in charge of monetary well, fiscal spending and things like that and it doesn't sound interesting but it is actually quite a dynamic game with lots of cross table bartering and politics that's really good yep. the weakness i found and uh, i don't know that it's to the same degree with I Am Zombie because we're still in very early stages of that, or I say we, uh, Mark and team are. Uh, but my biggest issue is the lack of ongoing support. I understand mm. democracy bit Mark quite hard, or seems yeah. to, because for one, it was delayed uh, quite extremely or felt like it was there was a lot of negative backlash from the supporters because it was one of the very first kickstarters that didn't deliver on time uh, sadly for mark and um there were various promised expansions and so on that are even detailed in the manual that will never see the light of day and i think because it left such a bad taste and probably dent in mark's wallet so yeah in fairness to him why would he continue to pursue a project that wasn't a money maker he's a yeah. businessman <clears throat> of course but it's it means the game kind of feels incomplete it, yeah. it's good for what it is but it feels like it could have been much more mm. yeah um, one other question before we move on to another topic. I was wondering because, well, I've, I've started this show recently, and even though it's not exactly the same platform or format, uh, did you do anything in particular to to grow your subscribers or, or promote your video channel? Or do, uh, do you no. think there's any particular tips? Or? <laughs> I... One thing, I I stopped being asked this a while ago, probably because I was overtaken by the Dawnforged casts, uh-huh. uh, Get Geek and Sundry, and I'm sure there are others, but yeah. I, my subscriber base was certainly overtaken because these are people who are more organized and treating this more as a business effort. Yeah. I have I've not been horrendous at self-promotion, but I've never really seen the need to do it. Yeah. And that isn't because, wow, my, my channel grew in a subscriber base rapidly. For the first three years, I was probably under a thousand subscribers mm. 
my channel very much grew organically. There was no doubt a time when I had more videos than I did subscribers, and there's a lot of vloggers in a similar situation, which is an odd way to be. It's like being a writer who's released more books than he's read, if you see what I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, so my channel, I posted on the occasional forum. I didn't really engage in social media too much. Mm -hmm. I certainly didn't. I, I would say the biggest booms to my subscriber base, quite unintentionally, were the interviews and more likely the Vampire Masquerade clan videos. Um, Which were really that, good, by the way. Oh, thank you very much. The, I, a lot of people do seem to like yeah. them. And, and I did a similar thing for Werewolf the Apocalypse. The, these are both uh, horror role-playing games, but I essentially focused on different elements of the game, did an in-depth discovery of each element, and just rattled on for 10 yeah. to 15 minutes about that element. And for some reason, the fan bases of those games just poured out in droves i think if i don't know whether you've checked but i think if you look at my most popular videos on the main channel the vampire ones are, are up there they've got tens of thousands of views sometimes yeah, yeah more. some of them do yeah absolutely particularly your uh, first reviews i think of uh of well I, mean, I don't know if they were the first reviews but some of the yeah vampire the masquerade related ones anyway it's, mm. it has been a very very popular game and video game and and uh, live action there's been a lot of other extensions, which is a good segue because so you're an enthusiast of, of the world of darkness and Vampire the Masquerade, and it's some it's a game I haven't really talked about with anybody on my on my podcast just yet. So can can you and for the people listening who don't really know much about it, can you tell us a little bit more about the setting and uh, yeah, yeah, of course. The world of darkness is a setting that is essentially um, our world in darkness it's uh, our world where everything has been slightly ramped up you're more likely to get mugged on the street you're more likely to get knifed in a club people are more likely to be doing drugs in the, in the restrooms and not only that well not only is crime high corruption disgusting and purity fast on the wane there are also creatures of the night that dwell there that are probably fostering these attitudes that are encouraging them, whether intentionally or not. And these creatures include vampires and werewolves and mages and wraiths and changelings. And these groups don't necessarily have sympathetic agendas towards one another or indeed a, the, a single agenda within their own line. Vampires, for instance, are split between, at the very least, 13 clans or families or houses or vampire who all descend from a different founder and so they each have different arrays of abilities different cultures different backgrounds and setups and and different agendas so while you may have the uh, let's say classist ventru who are often stereotypically seen to be occupying boardrooms and commanding corporations from on high mm -hmm. you have the more street level bruja and gangrel who are roiling for a fight likely to take up with biker gangs counterculture and prey on victims within that Yep. Uh, that kind of sphere and and so it goes throughout all the world of darkness settings it's a really nice overlay for our current world in the sense that as well as being a fully fleshed setting yep. it's just it's simply good fun for the easter eggs it's fun for being able to imagine your own home city as a world of darkness setting mm. and this is what makes it an easy game to run because you can set it in your own city and you can just tilt elements from your own city maybe a maybe a serial killer that was operating a few years ago was in fact a vampire maybe that disused building you pass on the way to work every single day is a vampire's haven uh, the place where he sleeps during the day or maybe that nightclub that you have to you can only get in by exclusive invitation is a vampire's elysium where they all hang out and make their plots for the yeah. city i i find that kind of that kind of setting and inspiration incredibly evocative to my mind and well, it appear from the popularity of the videos that several yeah. other people do as well yeah, yeah how did you first find out about it um vampire first came to me 
when I, okay so uh, a little bit of preamble uh because this is a fun story again okay. talking about socially dysfunctional role players <laughs> uh, where, uh, with my okay. first club the place that i had played hercules and xena and dungeons and dragons there was talk of a road trip to a place called aldershot aldershot is a largely military town that for doesn't have much to speak for it. Actually, I, I've been be there honest. once on business. It's quite funny. Yeah, it's it's not got a list, it's not got much, but no, it does have a game it. shop. Okay, and that's one thing Salisbury did not have. Okay, so let's talk of a road trip to all the shops to go to this game shop, spend a few pounds, and and buy a few games. Yeah, and four of us wanted to go, and so I was sat in the back of a car. Uh, with these um, three other gamers around me. And it was around the time that Attack of the Clones was due to come out. Okay. And I was speaking to the guy in the back with me, who is our Dungeons & Dragons GM, about a trailer that I had seen uh, where Yoda was hopping around with a lightsaber. Spoilers. And I think by now it should be all right. <laughs> yeah. And the... Um, I had no idea that the guy sat in front of me was a Star Wars fanatic and wanted to avoid spoilers like the plague. Oh, right. And all of a sudden, I saw this looming face between the two front seats as he wheeled around, reached out, grabbed me by the collar, pulled me forwards into his face, raised his other hand in a fist above oh my, my head, and said, if you mention that film one more fucking time, pardon the language, <laughs> I will smash your face in. And shortly after, and I didn't say much for the rest of the trip, to be quite honest, it was a no, bit I can startling. <laughs> That's a bit uh, extreme. Uh, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Th- th- I think uh, as a role player, this guy has, not just as a role player, as a human being, he has certain certain issues. I remember him throwing a chair across the club when his character died once, so he's not necessarily what you might call uh, adjusted. He, We went to this game <laughs> store where I picked up godlike a superhero role-playing game set in the Second World War, and on the recommendation of my... Dungeons and Dragons GM Vampire uh, yeah. the Masquerade and he was telling me all about Vampire in the McDonald's or equivalents uh, while we were well shortly before we went into the shop and so I was quite amped up for it and I saw it in there and picked it up and yeah it was probably the second or third role playing game I ever bought yeah. and from that point on a bond was a blood bond was formed to the game yeah did you think because this has been a very popular game uh i think in part as far as i understood and heard it partly inspired by the Anne rice vampire chronicles and but i wonder how much it influenced the later or more recent fad for vampires you know a la twilight uh, as such and such. oh it definitely did yeah uh, the if you ask Mark Reinhagen, he would probably tell you that more than Anne Rice, it was influenced by counterculture, about uh, football role players not feeling like they fit into the normal world. And these okay. days, that kind of outsiderness or otherness that role players have is greatly diminished. Geek culture is in. Yeah. But at the time, in the 90s, that wasn't the case. And so to play punks and anarchists and bikers and the like, you're all outsiders. You're all yeah. playing people who are against the law. Hmm. And so Vampire really, as as you're playing a race of characters that has to exist out of normal humanity, what is a huge has huge appeal to an outsider player that means they don't really have to stretch themselves too much but yeah uh, vampire subsequently had an influence uh, notably to bring up one of the one of the sort of skeletons in the closet of vampire the masquerade hmm. it influenced the underworld franchise oh, yeah. because uh, to the extent that white wolf sued uh sony white wolf were the producers for vampire the masquerade and they sued sony yeah. for underworld because uh 
there were photos of the vampire rule books around the set of underworld and various elements from the initial scripts i think and 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 maybe even the final version i I did watch it but i can't remember much of it were quite directly lifted from the world of darkness setting it doesn't surprise me i mean uh, yeah i've seen it a while ago as well and it wasn't hugely memorable but no, but uh, um, Sony settled out of court, which tends to mean good things. Well, it meant good, very good things for White Wolf because mm. shortly after Sony did that, I believe that was when Mark Reinhagen s- cashed in his shares. I don't think there was a much better opportunity to do that. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I I could well see just the same as, as unknowingly, or people don't seem to recognize this, Call of Cthulhu mm-hmm. has... You know, Cthulhu is everywhere these days. You yeah, see extremely Cthulhu, popular. Cthulhu plushies, Cthulhu's hanging off of rear view mirrors in cars. There's there's Cthulhu toys for babies. Uh, uh, basically, Cthulhu is 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 a common meme these days. Yeah. And yet, it's not H.P. Lovecraft that made Cthulhu a common meme. And may, there may be some people that disagree with this, but H.P. Lovecraft's short stories were never popular. They were never hugely popular in his life. And indeed, Cthulhu as an entity was never really described, or not accurately described, because that's part of the of uh, Lovecraftiana. Yeah. The great old ones and his monsters are described in abstract ways so that you can't actually picture them with the human mind. Cthulhu was first pictured in the Call of Cthulhu role-playing game. And Sandy Peterson and Lynn Willis, who created that role-playing game and all, and spawned a whole torrent of offshoots. Now we have Arkham Horror, of course, we have Cthulhu Wars, we have various and sundry Call of Cthulhu role-playing games, but we have Cthulhu Media in hundreds of places. That is all down to a role-playing game that was released in the 70s. Mm. And I I guarantee a lot of the people that have Cthulhu dolls don't know that. That's not yeah. me saying that they're not true geeks, but it's nice to know where these things come from and what the influences are. And role-playing has a... When you think about the people that get into these industries, like making films, making media selling plushies a lot of these people have probably come from backgrounds where they did role play as younger uh, in in their younger generations even if they don't now yeah and so pulling this inspiration from games that are designed to provoke imagination and creativity stretch yeah absolutely i agree um cool so you mentioned the company white wolf and just so they first published these games, and then they sold, and then th- there's a certain point another company took over to recreate or took over the rights to the line called Onyx Path that you write for now. Yeah. Uh, but then recently, White Wolf came back, so I wasn't sure exactly what what the organization was around that, I mean, without going no. into too much detail, and how uh, you well, start no, writing no, no. them. That's fine. The the chronology is this. White Wolf started off as a magazine publisher and got into the field of publishing tabletop role-playing games with games such as Vampire the Masquerade. They were running along quite happily. Vampire, at one point in the 90s, was the number one selling role-playing game above Dungeons & Dragons even. So you couldn't really ask for more than that. White Wolf... uh, Obviously, they started saturating media, action figures, uh, posters, jewelry, yeah. and and even swords. You could get glaives or claves, rather, for Werewolf, the Apocalypse. There, there was an awful lot out there. Yeah, they even had a TV series of Vampire the Masquerade called Kindred: The Embraced, uh, which has only got one season, but it is available on Blu-ray, I think. So. Anyway, White Wolf in the mid noughties as we call them. They were purchased by a company called CCP. Okay. CCP are an Icelandic company that are mostly known for releasing or creating, developing, supporting EVE Online, a a MMORPG. Right. And EVE Online, hugely popular. And their intention, CCP's intention, was to release a World of Darkness MMO because they saw the value of the license. And it it is a valuable license. And for many years, they trundled along uh, producing this MMORPG. 
for various reasons, they let go a lot of White Wolf employees. Uh, so the tabletop division, mm. it wasn't as profitable as the EVE Online division is the gist of it, as I understand it. Okay. But I, I can't be held to that. No, no, sure. And the uh, focus on World of Darkness shifted. It got very... Well, it, it was very radically reduced. Yeah. To the point that ultimately... Rich Thomas, one of these ex uh, White Wolfers, CCPers, set up his own company, Onyx Path Publishing, or rather, uh, via CCP and White Wolf, while it was still a brand, published the Vampire the Masquerade 20th Anniversary Edition with the simple idea that it was going to be a nostalgia book. There was yeah. no intention of following it up with further books, uh, and or indeed 20th anniversaries for the other lines. But due to its massive popularity, it instilled in Rich an idea that he would set up his own company, Onyx Path Publishing, and so he did. Yeah. Onyx Path Publishing purchased the license to publish these books with permission from CCP, okay. who owned the White Wolf brand. Yeah. White Wolf isn't defunct at this point. Uh, it's just they aren't publishing anything. No one works for White Wolf at this point right. in the chronology. It's just stagnant. Exactly. So Onyx Path are publishing all the World of Darkness lines and the various other games that White Wolf used to support. CCP... Uh, very recently sold the White Wolf brand to Paradox Interactive, who are another video game publisher okay. who or, and developer who do the very popular Crusader Kings uh, series as long as Europa, as well as Europa Universalis. And, oh, yes, I know you Okay, yeah. And they um, have a much greater vested interest in World of Darkness than CCP did. Essentially, the MMORPG never came to fruition with CCP. It ended up being cancelled, yeah. and that's why they sold the license. Okay. So, um, Paradox bought the license, and now White Wolf, as an entity, exists again with two employees, and they are planning in the background a One World of Darkness line, uh, which <coughs> will probably be multimedia uh, and no doubt cover things like video games, tabletop role playing games, maybe board games, and who knows, maybe even TV shows and movies. We, yeah. don't, we don't know at this okay. point. But it is an exciting time to be a fan of World of Darkness. Yeah. Onyx Path, meanwhile, continued to pr produce the line that was once known as New World of Darkness or Chronicles of Darkness, a slightly different universe. And the One World of Darkness books under their 20th anniversary banners. So mm -hmm. you can still buy books for Vampire 20th Anniversary, Werewolf, Mage, all of these 20th anniversary lines are still supported and still being released. And the intention, as far as I know it, although I'm not an authority, is sure. that they will continue to do so maybe up until or even by um, surpassing the point that White Wolf release a fourth edition of Vampire. Okay. Do you think uh, on the Onyx Path, and this is interesting because I, I had seen, but after the facts, because at, at that particular point I wasn't playing too much, the 20th anniversary vampire book was massively popular. It seemed to be a, a good timing between the, the time they created Onyx Path and the rising popularity of crowdfunding platforms. Yeah, yeah, everything gelled pretty well, but it's worth noting Vampire the Masquerade 20th Anniversary wasn't uh, crowdfunded in the sense that we know it now. It wasn't put on Kickstarter okay. or Indiegogo or the like. It was funded entirely from people visiting the White Wolf website. Right. So while a lot of people in our hobby now know that there's a 20th anniversary of Vampire the Masquerade, the deluxe versions that were released at that time, and you can buy the non-deluxe versions from Drive Through RPG, but the leather-bound edition that you could buy through White Wolf through pre-ordering mm -hmm. wasn't as successful as the subsequent 20th anniversaries that managed to get the publicity of Kickstarter and so on. Yeah. Uh, Vampire 20th anniversary is kind of orga again organically grown trundled on beyond its initial uh, uh beyond its initial funding but yeah uh, in terms of the the timing for all the rest of the Onyx Path projects the birth of Kickstarter has really changed the playing field and helped them produce some really lovely looking books yeah cool and how did you start writing for them how did that happen 
Well, it's a controversial way, or, or well, should I say, uh, it's it's a way some people look leery on, and I'm I'm going to defend myself here. Okay. So it's nothing to do with the YouTube channel. Right. Uh, nothing to do with that. Uh, some people have accused me of that, and I find that quite amusing because I was doing the YouTube channel, as you say, since 2009. I certainly yeah. had no writing gigs then. Um, I backed Book of the Worm. No, I bu- backed Werewolf of the Apocalypse 20th Anniversary Edition. Werewolf the Apocalypse 20th Anniversary Edition was uh, a game I was really enthusiastic for, but one mm-hmm. of the backer levels was a level that allowed you to basically be a consulting developer on an upcoming werewolf book. Okay. And I remember requesting specifically that I became that I could be a, a consulting developer on Book of the Worm 20th Anniversary Edition. Now, that didn't assign me any word count. But I came up with lots of ideas, and eventually I did do some writing for it. I wrote up the board of directors of Pentex, which is a multinational evil corporation and werewolf, and uh, a, a, a couple of thousand words. It wasn't anything great, mm-hmm. but what I got to do was put in a first draft, get it redlined, which is essentially uh, corrected and amended and given developer commentary by Stu Wilson, the developer of that game. And then I had to write a final draft and submit that, which was approved and put into the book and so on. Now, some people look a bit sniffily at that method of entering the writing sphere because I bought my way in. Uh, But, my justification for it, which I stand by, was that, for one thing, they didn't have to allow me to write anything. That wasn't what I'd paid for. And the second thing, the main reason I did that was actually to get experience of writing, to get to see how the machine worked. And essentially, it was no different than paying the money for a creative writing course. Yeah, I think it's brilliant. I wanted to be able to essentially write something, get their developers to go over it with a fine tooth comb, tell me what I was doing wrong and right. And I was very fortunate because Stu Wilson is a very attentive developer uh, and will will quite happily pull no punches in saying what's wrong and what's right. Yeah. And so he and so he did that with my work. After that, I was bolstered with a confidence that allowed me to submit a completely separate draft of work to C. A. Suleiman, mm-hmm. who was developing the Mummy: The Curse line for Chronicles of Darkness, uh, which is again the slightly separate universe yeah. to the One World of Darkness. Yeah. And, and I'll add links for everything we're talking about on the show notes so that people can go and check everything out. Okay, uh, so uh, yeah, so I submitted some work to him, and I essentially submitted this work based on what I had learned from my limited work on Book of the Worm, and CA liked it enough to give me a twenty thousand word writing gig on a book called Sothis Ascends for Mummy. Mummy is one of the World's Darkness lines mm-hmm. uh, in which you play the eponymous mummies. Mm-hmm. And I was given the task of writing 20,000 words on the era. Uh, now I'm going to have to think back. I think it was about 551 uh, CE or, well, essentially around the era of the rise of Islam. Okay. And how that affects the world and how it affects mummies it wasn't predominantly about the rise of islam but that was i suppose the biggest event of the time uh and justinian is the emperor of uh, the holy roman empire and, and so on and so i wrote a hi- history chapter uh, it ties back into everything i was talking about earlier about uh, i was incredibly inspired to write history my first real work was writing this i got paid for it and i got to talk about the history of the holy roman empire the uh the visigoths the uh let's think what else the burgeoning uh caliphates which mm-hmm. hadn't appeared at this point the remnants of uh rome in the in britannia and uh gaul and and the like and it was really good fun and i'm still proud of the work i did on that today because mostly because i was spending hours in the library 
doing research. Yeah. I wanted everything that I wrote for this to be as accurate, but as interesting as possible. And and my my philosophy when writing anything, and that hasn't changed since the board of directors book of the worm, in fact, is to provide utility to players and storytellers. Yeah. I want every single paragraph I write to make the reader think, oh, I could use that in a game, or yes. that would be an interesting thing to put into a game, or, or just to make them smile or think or be horrified. Essentially, I want to evoke a reaction. Mm-hmm. I don't want to put words on a page just for the sake of having words there. So if, if I ever do systems, and yeah. I, I think I put some into Sophos Ascends, I want it to be a system that people will want to use, not a system that has to be used because it's there. Yeah. And so that's what I've done. Cool. Well, that's what I've aimed to do with everything I've written since yeah. then. Brilliant. Uh, did you do a lot of writing for your games beforehand? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, usually people do, but I, but I was wondering if you were more on the very writing or improvising. It's changed a lot games. over the years. My first Dungeons and Dragons campaign, and in fact, my I, re- I recapped a Pathfinder campaign. Pathfinder is a sort of derivative of Dungeons and Dragons, and better in my opinion. It's a I did a, a recap of that campaign on my channel, and. For that game, I had essays of notes, encyclopedias, uh, detailing the important characters, events, locations, and so on. And I remember the players always being quite astounded by how much I had prepared for this game. Mm. And I think that was probably the last game that I wrote in that much detail. Mm. Since that time... I think it was that game that really tipped me over the edge of confidence in role-playing to improvise completely because there was a scene where they were well, they were still on a plateau. It was yeah. surrounded by towers of various different construction, a tower of bone, a tower of stone, a tower of rot, and so on. And my plan was that they would go for the tower that they could enter easily and adventure through it loot it for whatever they had to get their clues and then move on to the next tower Uh they went for a completely different tower (laughs) and they bypassed the various tricks and traps that i had planned that they would come across uh if they went for it and so i had to improvise an entire dungeon yes uh every single room every single monster every single trap and this was at the very start of a three-hour session but (laughs) but i did it and it was probably one of the best sessions that i ran the players had no idea that i was improvising and it made me realize all these notes i'm writing now while they they are fun they're also time consuming and it's time i could be spending doing other things because clearly i have been doing this long enough now that i don't need to flesh everything out on paper i can just have it in my mind yeah and while uh, if i write a dark ages vampire game for instance that's uh, predicated on traveling from one part of the world to to constantinople for instance i'm going to want to put brief details on paper about the locations they may come across the the vampires they're in the plots they might stumble upon but i'm not going to be writing out dialogue or i'm yeah. not going to be writing out set pieces because i can describe that kind of thing yes. now you have the experience yeah yeah all right, uh, just being mindful of time, there's a couple more things I want to cover before we finish this. Yeah, I'm okay to, I'm, I'm having fun. I'm okay, okay to great. stick around as I'm long as you need too. me. Brilliant. Uh, one thing I definitely wanted to mention, because we, we played in a scene together about a year ago uh, during that, you started, I believe you started, but you tell me, tell me if it's not the case. Vampire the Masquerade is a game that's played around the table, as we mentioned. It's mm-hmm. also played in live action role playing games. Yeah. And you've first created a kind of hybrid of the two, sort of. Uh, the YouTube experiment, Vampire the Masquerade YouTube experiment. Yeah. Uh, Can you explain yeah. what it is, basically? Uh, yeah, so the Vampire the Masquerade YouTube experiment, and by all means, feel free to link to that as well, is still yeah. going, uh, The and, and it's still very popular. I liked the... Uh, I 
I was really keen to engage with the people that were watching my channel, commenting on my videos, who were all saying, I love Vampire, I love the idea of Vampire, but I never get a chance to play it, or I have no group. And it always frustrated me in a little way to see people say that, because I thought, you're all there, you're all commenting on the same page saying, I've got no group. And yet, with Google Hangouts or with Skype, you can all just play together. Why not use your initiative and get in touch with each other but you know such is life so what i said (laughs) was i will set up a game a group on facebook where we will all create characters it will be essentially be a living city Mm -hmm. of vampire the masquerade and if it was successful we'd expand to werewolf and mage and so on so expecting about 20 or 30 players to sign up to this and we would be able to run various plots simultaneous plots that will have knock-on effects to each other the admins will be able to coordinate that kind of thing and you would have big elysium scenes so that's like a vampire party where everyone turns up and gets introduced to to the prince, gets involved in various other plots. Essentially, it would be like a live-action role-playing game, but without having to leave the comfort of your own study or living room or bedroom or basically PC. And I was amazed by the fact that I think we got something like 150 players within the first month. Which must have been crazy to coordinate. Yeah, it was crazy to coordinate. It was incredibly stressful to coordinate, and it was something that all of us were unprepared for. Very swiftly, people volunteered to become admins. Very swiftly, most of those admins said, you know what, this is too much. And for the first few months, I was up into the wee hours of the morning having to message players that were disgruntled about a plot or their character or sort out issues between players who (laughs) had uh, issues with one another or this person's cheating or this person's power gaming or this person was rude to me. And, you know, that that's fine. That's the job of an admin or the job of a games master. But it was a much greater undertaking than I ever anticipated. Now, I... That doesn't make me regret its founding. There are some people who were involved in it at that early stage who blamed it for their near divorce, blamed that, blamed Vampire the Masquerade YouTube experiment for losing friends or uh, being put off role playing entirely, which was really unfair because they there were so many people that were getting something out of it. Yeah. Out of these 150 players, I would say 20 players got if that got really upset because they weren't getting to do what they wanted to do but what i found fascinating in that and and what you're just saying right now is uh, uh, years ago i've played a lot of well vampire live action role play and uh Mm. the the kind of situations were exactly the same i mean the complaints the and i have a close friend who 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 was a, a a storyteller and an admin for several years in one of the cities in france and i mean the kind of stories he told me much later about what was going on was sometimes a little bit frightening, but also a lot of fun. So there's yeah, well, a, a bit of well, everything. Well, that's the thing. The, the feedback I have got from Vampire the Masquerade YouTube experiment, and the reason it was the YouTube experiment is because every single session would be recorded, every single session would be uploaded to YouTube, so that if you ever needed to refer back to an old game and an interaction, or just watch other players having a scene, because there were some really fantastic scenes, and there still are, mm. uh, because as I say, it is still going, which is testament to the fact that it works. Uh, it's just you need the right mentality to do it. Yeah. Um, everything would be there recorded, preserved. Websites were set up around it. Various offshoots were set up. Different uh, cliques of players set up different communities for different games. Essentially, it started a wave of this role-playing via Google Hangouts. I can't take full credit for Google Hangout role-play because I know people would have been doing it, but yeah. but that kind of uh, genre, that I, as far as I know, it was the first. And um, I get a lot of feedback from people thanking me for setting it up because they finally had a chance to role-play. They've met so many new friends and 
been able to play characters they've always wanted to play and because of where they live or because they may have some social dysfunction or they may be uncomfortable putting themselves out in a face-to-face environment Mm. that's absolutely fine because you can do this from your pc yeah i think the biggest frustrations for me because i stepped down from it i i it wasn't i was there for probably a year maximum yeah uh and that was good enough for me i got what i wanted out of it i got a chance to role play i was the prince of the city and i had some really fun scenes and i played other characters as well from time to time but my greatest frustration was and uh, this applies to most things in role playing uh was players who refused to take the initiative which is an interesting turn of phrase given that in role playing game taking initiative or rolling initiative is a quite an important fact mm-hmm. you have to if you want to get yourself involved in a community of role players complaining that there are no scenes ongoing or no games ongoing is a is like well it's pissing in the wind what you yeah. should be doing is running your own game it's a, or it's, it, yeah. if there's no session local to you look online i yeah. guarantee there'll be a convention near you or join a game online and so a lot of the people that left vampire the masquerade youtube experiment and its offshoots because oh it was too slow well you need to actually put the effort in yourself you can't just be herded into these games and into these plots start these plots yourself be the innovator be the imagination and be yeah. creative and too many people want that handed to them yeah which is a shame but it just goes to show it works for some people and it doesn't work for others yeah what do you think of the the main kind of with more and more video you know google hangout skype role-playing games going on what do you think of the advantages and inconvenience of, of kind of doing it via video versus face-to-face around a table or in a living room? Oh, I don't find the difference terribly terribly pronounced. I prefer to role-play in person mostly for reactions and because when I'm role-playing on video, it feels like a more orchestrated, organized affair most of the time. Yeah. And if you've got a big group when you're playing online, it can become more difficult than around a table to get a word in edgeways at a table you are watching people's body language and so you can see whether they want to talk on google hangouts or skype or tiny chat or what have you you don't know and so people try and jostle for position in a game with more than four players that you're running over google hangouts it can become quite a chaotic mess Mm. Uh, and so I would say that is the only disadvantage. I, I'd say the advantages vastly outweigh the disadvantages. This medium and Vampire the Masquerade YouTube experiment especially gave us the opportunity to role play with people from the other side of the world. Yeah. Just at the drop of a hat. You, you, there was no long winded organization that you needed to put into it. You didn't have to say, Well, I'll meet you this time next year in this place. All you have to do is get in front of a camera, and all of a sudden you're role playing with someone in Japan or South Korea or, or Australia. For, for, for my case, you know, that, that would usually be a, a horrendous thing to try and arrange, but now you can role play with whoever you want it also means and this is an advantage it does have over tabletop Mm -hmm. you can pick and choose your players your ensemble yes tabletop is brilliant i love it i would not stop doing it if i had the choice but you can sometimes if you go to a formal club end up playing with people that you don't like or you don't get on with or whose play style doesn't merge with yours online because you have to message people in advance and say do you want to play this or do you want to play that or can i play in your game you're more likely to end up with people that either you you know or you know share an interest of yours you're not just again herded into a game that's running just because you need to get a game in yeah on google hangouts you're you're playing a game because you want to play that game with these people yes which I think is, uh, which helps make the hobby um, more amenable, more approachable to players who have specific needs. Yeah, yeah. All right. Um, 
Cool. Do you, so just to finish before, uh, the, do you have any other projects on the go yourself? Like the or games that you're writing or? Uh, yeah. Well, uh, for uh, that you well, can talk well, about, of course. Right? Yeah. Uh, no, no. For World of Darkness, let's think. I have now written for several of the One World of Darkness games. So we have Werewolf, of course, with Book of the Worm. We have Wraith the Oblivion with the 20th anniversary edition. I've written yep. for that. I'm Changing looking forward the to Dreaming. that one. Yep, Changeling the Dreaming 20th anniversary edition. I wrote for that. Wraith is a superb game. It's going to look beautiful when it comes out. I know Rich Dansky, the developer who I interviewed on my channel as well, mm-hmm. is uh, is feverishly working away at that in between uh, very sad personal tragedies. But he is a master at this. So I, I am I guarantee that when that book comes out, it is going to be sublime. Yeah. The uh, and of course I've written a a handful shall we say of vampire books now both for dark ages and masquerade or written for them i've not written any entire uh and for chronicles of darkness i've written for mummy the curse uh, a couple of books now and beast the primordial now uh, if you look me up on drive through rpg what i've just said isn't going to come out in okay. the wash you'll type in matthew dawkins and you will see book of the worm and sothis ascends maybe even just sothis ascends because i th- think my additional writing credit for book of the worm won't uh, appear but the other games i've written for of which there's somewhere between 10 and 15 um are all in the production schedule and games maybe contrary to popular opinion take a while to release yeah because there's uh, there's a first there's an outline stage there's a first draft stage there's a red line stage there's final draft development editing art layout production release all of that can take about two years time and so i started doing this freelance writing in late 2013 so this year should probably see a lot of books with my name on coming out i hope so anyway because there's a lot of lot i've written for that i'm very proud of one vampire release that's coming out that i'm particularly keen on is beckett's uh, jihad diary okay not a jihad well i suppose it is a holy war but beckett is one of the in law, in canon protagonists of Vampire the Masquerade. He is a gangrel, which is a bestial clan, but he's an archaeologist and he studies the history of vampires. So throughout a number of Vampire the Masquerade books of old, you would get Beckett's interjections or you'd get novels about him where he's saying, well, this is why the vampires are like this. A bit of a hitchhiker's guide. Okay. Uh, it, interruption in a in a chapter beckett would would throw in his opinion and that would always be fun so for vampire the masquerade 20th anniversary edition we have written a book called beckett's jihad diary the jihad is the eternal war eternal struggle if you like between various vampires uh, and th- this has been going on for millennia that vampires of ancient age are the ones pulling the strings pushing the chess pieces all of your characters are pawns on a board uh, or puppets that are being controlled in the jihad and in this book which is i think 150,000 words long so it's a big one beckett pretty much explores every single avenue of the vampire the masquerade corner of the world of darkness so if you want clan history that's in it bloodline law that's in it Um, what what happened to this vampire that's in it what's going on in this city that's in it um what are the what are the threats of the clan founders rising and eating all of their child that's in it there's action there's drama there's sex there's basically everything and blood drinking of course it is a game of vampire um but it's it's such a complete book and because it's written all in that first person it's all beckett's it's not just beckett writing a diary because that would look boring it's beckett's diaries with transcripts of conversations it's um a words scratched onto human flesh it's tablets of stone that he's discovered it's going to be a huge in-character book that is 
written like a scrapbook, like a journal, and it will there it will look absolutely stunning. Has that one already gone through like a crowdfunding project or? Uh, no, no, it's not. I don't know whether it will be on Kickstarter. I hope it will be. Okay. Uh, that's that's entirely up to Rich. Okay. Uh, if it is, uh, it will make it look even better. But due to the word count and the amount of art that's uh, going to be needed for it because of the way we've written it, uh, um, I could well see it ending up being crowdfunded. But cool. again, that's up to Rich. Hopefully that will see the light of day or the dark of night by the end of this year um and if it does that is a game that is a book i sincerely recommend people picking up sounds great all right uh i usually finish the interviews with a few kind of cool down questions okay and this is the ice cream for everyone podcast and it's traditional to ask if you have a favorite ice cream flavor i do uh, i i favor the mint chuck chip ice cream flavor although in my dotage i have um started leaning towards rum and raisin interesting uh, the mint chalk chip is a is is extremely popular i don't know if it's a i'm gonna start making some statistics the more interviews you it's interesting. well i never understand i i think the biggest disappointment you can have eating an ice cream is thinking it's a mint chalk chip and finding out it's some kind of pistachio monstrosity <laughs> I like pistachio. <laughs> <laughs> um, another one is I work in marketing and advertising. And, you know, given you have a lot of experience with YouTube channels, it's a quite interesting area. And I was wondering what you think, as a person who published videos on YouTube for a long time, what you think of advertising on YouTube, like pre-rolls and... Uh, oh, um, yeah. I- I'm absolutely comfortable with them. I've been doing them for years and I think that the idea that people some people do take exception uh the the common complaint is well this is a hobby this is supposed to be fun you shouldn't be putting banners on these things simple way to get around it is if you don't like it don't click on it (laughs) or or click off of it it's it's no, no great shakes i don't see why a creator should have to we should have to create things for free to be taken seriously and if my channel has shown anything if geek and sundry has shown anything if dawnforge cast has shown anything it's that advertising does not lead your channel becoming less popular yeah uh far from it and if you if you can earn a few extra quid by putting uh, adverts on your channel that you can then put into buying new role-playing games that can allow you to review new role-playing games then excellent fund your own hobby with the love of your viewers uh, i think I there's absolutely no harm in marketing yeah you're foolish if you don't do it yeah um, there's another thing because I work on marketing strategy and usually the brands, brands or products, when they're advertising, they think of the core audience they're trying to target. And one of the areas that you might know about or that we know about is, uh, and also because you go to a lot of conventions like Marvel or superhero movies, or sometimes the sci-fi channel, these kinds of people are testing new ideas, showing through viral videos or comic conventions. Um, do you know... Or do you have an idea what what these kinds of companies could be doing if they targeted, or would it be worthwhile to target role playing games, role playing gamers as a group? Uh, well, I think it's telling that for a long time people have said that role playing games are on the wane, which is clearly not true it's just there's an awful lot of role-playing games out there now uh, you just have to attend a convention you see that there's more people at these things now than there ever were 10 mm. years ago gen con ex- is explosive with popularity yep. in america uh, so to my mind the most obvious method of marketing to consumers for uh, role-playing game companies is to really get in on the ground floor at these conventions, go to the new conventions as well, smaller conventions, get yourself out there. Uh, there there are companies I know of that sometimes bemoan, uh, even publicly, my, um, our product isn't selling well, uh, so we, we don't think we've got the fan base. And I find myself asking, have you actually introduced yourself to the fan base? Yeah. You can say an awful lot for uh, advertising online, putting banner ads on RPG Net, putting videos out there on YouTube, mm-hmm. but ju- no YouTube channel grows overnight 
my one took many years to grow to the level it has and mine isn't massive by any means it's big in our hobby but it's you know peanuts compared to a lot of channels so i think that kind of marketing while necessary should not be the marketing that's relied upon in our hobby which is still predominantly a hobby that's played face to face around a tabletop you need to actually meet the customer and if that means traveling to a convention or sending a representative to a convention uh, as an example and it's something i will be taking up with onyx path but i will i don't mind saying it here i will be speaking to rich thomas about whether he wants me to essentially wear the Onyx Path hat at UK-based conventions, because I can get to them, sure, I can promote the products, and I can increase awareness, and I don't mind doing it. I won't even ask for a fee for it. Uh, it, it. It would be my pleasure. But there's companies, I think the most telling one, was at Gen Con last year, unless I was completely blind, mm-hmm. Wizards of the Coast were not there. So Magic the Gathering was there, mostly run by volunteers, and I think some Wizards employees who... uh, Wizards of the Coast produced Dungeons & Dragons, for anyone who doesn't know. And and Magic the Gathering. And and Magic the Gathering, which is their major cash cow. And that good for them. Magic is a perfectly fine game. That is extremely surprising. They wouldn't have a presence at Gen Con. Exactly, but I understand that's been the case for a couple of years. And so Paizo are there, and they produce Mm -hmm. Pathfinder. Onyx Path are there, they publish World of Darkness. Pinnacle is there, they do Savage Worlds. Chaosium are there. Basically, every role-playing company that is worthy of note, and even some that aren't, but all that want to be, are at Gen Con, because it is the biggest convention for our hobby. But where was the Dungeons and Dragons stand? Where was their pomp and ceremony that heralded them as the leader of surprising. our hobby? And I wonder if I, it has to do with being owned by purchased by Hasbro and cutting budgets or something. Well, the, but they were published by Hasbro many, many years ago, and I think Wizards oh, of the Coast true. they they often do panels and seminars at these uh, conventions, but it just strikes me as a very strange practice i'm sure they have perfectly good strategists telling them the reason why they should be doing this Mm. but for me as a customer it puts me off it means well i'm not going to buy your product if if i can see pelgrane press selling 13th age there uh, and paizo selling pathfinder those are the two biggest rivals to your fantasy banner and and chaosium with rune quest and there is no Dungeons & Dragons stall selling Dungeons & Dragons products. All that tells me is you do not have faith in your own products. You, you will not sell them in person. You do not know how to sell them in person. Therefore, I will not buy them. Yeah. And maybe that's an extreme. And I will, of course, buy D&D things from time to time because it's the largest game in our hobby. Or, or is, well, was... But it's just a little sad. It feels like a company that is somewhat out of touch with what it needs to yeah. do to remain relevant. Yeah, it is a little bit sad, I agree, particularly knowing that it, you know, it's the most famous brand, the most famous and the oldest role-playing game. At a moment where role-playing games and you know geek culture is becoming more popular, more mainstream, so they could be supporting that. And mm. if they're not present at a convention, it doesn't feel like they are. Yeah, well, that's the thing. Will Wheaton uh, was there, uh, of course, yeah. well known uh, from both Star Trek and Geek and Sundry, and he was there to promote Titan's Grave, which is the setting for Fantasy Age, which is another fantasy, medieval fantasy style role playing game uh, with sci fi elements published by Green Ronin. And so that wheeling out that kind of star power, that's the kind of thing that draws notice. Mm. Now, I will add the caveat Wizards of the Coast, if they were there, and I was there for the full convention. I just didn't see them. And okay. I don't believe that they were there. So I, I would be interested to find out if I am, in fact, incorrect on this. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll check it and uh, we'll see. If, if anybody has anything to correct, you can do that in the comments as well. Yeah. All right. Well, Matthew, thank you so much for your time. This was a fun conversation. Well, thank you very much for having me. Yeah, it has been a lot of fun. I'll be happy to to come on again if you can think of anything else to ask. If I have another reason or something else, I'd be happy to invite you again. All right, lovely. All right, thanks. Bye. Thank you.
Well, here we go. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the episode. It was a lot of fun recording and talking with Matthew. Uh, he's a fountain of knowledge and a fountain of information about role-playing games and about the settings in particular, as I'm sure you've heard. Uh, if you've enjoyed it, I repeat it, but how about sharing it with a friend? If you know a friend who's into role-playing games, if you know a friend who would enjoy this episode, send them the link via email or share it on your favorite social network. It really helps me and it helps more people discover the show. And that's essentially all I want. I mean, I just want more people to listen to this, essentially. Um, and of course, you can also find more Ice Cream for Everyone goodies to read or to listen to on the website. That's www.icecreamforeveryone.net. All the words spelled out. I write a weekly newsletter, which I've occasionally talked about. You can find on my website uh, called Ice Cream Sunday. No big prize for figuring out where that is published every week. And uh, normally you get it exclusively, well, you do get it exclusively by email. You get it first, but I've started publishing it online so more people can find it, just in case they might be interested in what's going on every week. And I'm going to be publishing it on my blog very shortly, uh, but it's already on Medium. You can find them on medium.com, and the link is on my website as well. Um, that's about it for now. Uh, I'll see you again next week. Until next time, game on, have fun, enjoy, and uh, thank you for listening. Game on!